Hi, it's repair time. Let's take a look at this uh, Sony boombox. It's a CFD V10 for those playing along at home. Old school cassette and this newfangled uh, compact disc player. And it's one of these uh, classic Sony little uh, sort of like desk boombox models. Can you really call it a boombox? It's not. It is technically, but it's not like 80s boombox. Anyway, this is late 90s vintage, and uh, this one belonged to my mum. It's been sitting around for a long time. Um, it, it's been in various uh, moves and whatnot. Uh, the poor antenna's been broken. All the electrons are going to fall out. Anyway, as is uh, common with these things, dual uh, mains and battle that looks like uh, uh, D instead of uh, those m mongrel C cells and the great thing about uh, Sony gear like this is that you can get the service manuals for them and they're fantastic and yes I can get the service manual for this particular Australian model and we'll take a look at that uh, later so stick around for that base reflex body I've got main driver plus a tweeter up there it's probably just one of those uh, piezo uh, type ones anyway. Let's plug this in and see what's wrong with it. Hopefully it's still buggered. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. There we go, it's buzzing. And that is independent. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, there we go. I thought I was gonna say that was independent of the volume control, but has it come good? Because before, it w I swear, Damn it, Murphy gets me every time, I swear it was. The fault with this thing has always been that it had this huge hum in it, regardless of any mode. It's probably come good. If I whack a CD in that, it's probably gonna work now. Oh, I've come a gutter. Do I even have a CD to put in it here in the lab? I don't think so. The first thing you would do is actually try this on uh, dual on battery power as well, to see if it's anything to do with the mains uh, power supply power it from the bench power supply. I like this, how they uh, use the board down there for the uh, final contact. You can see just a couple of jumper links on there for the positive terminal. Put some hot snot in there for good measure. Now, I was wondering actually how they switch between the DC source and the AC. They could just like diode or it. It's a bit uh, like often they'll have like a DC AC switch on it. Looked in here and I saw this. Look at this. I reckon that is a little micro switch that automatically disconnects the batteries when you plug in the AC power cord. Isn't that neat? <laughs> Love it. Well done. All right, let's power it up on DC. So I'll switch the output of the power supply. Whoop, it's drawing naff all. You can see that up there and you might be wondering, uh, where's the power switch on this thing? Well, it's actually the uh, tape CD radio off. There it is. So you put in tape. So let's whack it on. Whoa. Well, it turns out that radio reception sucks on the other side of my new lab here. I uh, put it near the window over here. Bob's your uncle. This is on the mains input. Working okay. Hmm. Anyway, it's still, I reckon it still has a problem. It's kind of come good, but yeah. Anyway, let's take it apart. Um, we're going to need a bigger boat. Unfortunately, that's the longest one I've got. Reaches in here. Doesn't reach in there. Oh! Unfortunately, this is a flathead. Yeah, I'm short by that much. Wouldn't you know it? Bloody Murphy. And the screws aren't those combo flathead Phillips either. Oh! And as usual on Sony gear, it's got the little screw marker. Beauty. Well, I'm back. And if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So here we go. There's some plastic in there. The head's too big. Unbelievable. Eventually got it though. There we go, look at that. 450 millimeters for those playing long at home. Aha! Uh -huh. There's one pesky screw right up in there, which you can't obviously get in like that. It just, the angles don't work. So you've got to put that down and get through the back there. Jeez, that's a bit rude. There we go. Like it just popped off all on its own. There it is. Oh, look at that the nice length on those to open it up. That's lovely. Like, you know, they've thought about servicing this thing. It's really quite neat. Ah, oh, it's on little slideys. Neat as. I really like how the tuning cog thing works here. You can see this, uh, this yellow looks like a cable tie type thing. That's just the uh, identifier on the front. That's just the marker on the uh, 
the front window, but then they've just got this cog wheel which then goes up against here. So you don't have to run all your little, uh, like little string things over to the front panel. Nice. Check it out, they faked the tweeter. There is no tweeter. There's the little, like, it looks like there's a little tweeter in there. It looks like it's a two-way jobby, but it's not. It's just a piece of molded plastic. It's terrible, Muriel, look at it. Anyway, there's the Sony uh, full range driver there, 2.8 ohms, 4 watts for those playing along at home. The reason it has to be such a low value 2.8 ohms, uh, very common because this thing is battery powered. It's only like 9 volts maximum, you know, it's going to operate that when the battery's drained. So you still want to get a decent amount of power out of the speakers without having to generate voltage doubler or something like that to generate a higher voltage uh, supply rail. So yeah, um, they go for the uh, low value jobs in those uh, particular cases. Very common with, uh, you know, little portable ones like this and uh, 12 volt car stereos too. So it's really easy just to take that entire uh, front panel assembly out. That's neat. So this is like a little, uh, that's a little LCD there that just displays the uh, track number and a few buttons and that's about all she wrote. So what I find interesting about the inside of here, look at all the uh, dust that's accumulated over the years, but look, they've got a foam piece there, which is sort of blocking that bit. There's no matching foam piece there. There's no foam over this side, yet there's some foam strategically struck down, uh, stuck down on this side here. Just find that rather curious. Anyway, there's our, is that our date code? Yeah, what does that say? So acoustically, that just seems like asymmetrical. Well, that's, you know, maybe because they've got the transformer over this side here, but I, I don't know if anyone's got any clue why they would strategically place one bit of foam there one one there and not match it on the other side um please let us know anyway they haven't done like a proper acoustic cavity in there but you know this would have been designed somewhat what's interesting is this down the bottom here this sticky bit that goes on the back of battery compartment that's that bit there i i don't understand that at all what on earth that is doing there. So if you have a look at the battery terminals here, positive, that PCB we saw before, the negative that's going over to this uh, uh, primary side mains board. So that little micro switch is way down in there. That's integrated into the mains input terminal. It's really interesting. This is just the main uh, uh, power out. So it's just a uh, single tap. And of course the PCB, single sided, none of that expensive double sided rubbish. Oh. I see a little resistor. I spy a little resistor in parallel across a diode there. Here's all our wave soldered uh, surface mount as is uh, typical with Sony construction. This mod wire down here, it's got this, uh, it's got some hot snot there and that's just jumping all the way over there. Oh, that's a ground. <laughs> that's as good as a star ground point as you'll ever see. Look at that and they're tapping that off. So they aren't actually bodges. That's just a way, that's just, they've done that for layout reasons. So they've got that going over to the headphone jack, goes from the star grounding point. And look at all, they count the number of branches off there. That's really quite nice. And then they jumper that all the way over to here. This is the AM antenna rod. So this is all part of the uh, AM uh, FM section, presumably. So yeah, they, they, they just couldn't get a decent ground on the layout from there over to there. They just needed a separate one. So, oh, let's run a wire. No wackers. And, you know, extra, extra production steps. Somebody's got to uh, assemble all that. But that would have been cheaper than going to a double-sided uh, PCB layout. Check out that one down there. It's a little diode, nicely stuck down with Celastic. Look at that, um, on top of that little uh, SO, fine pitch SO package there. Neat. So the first thing we're gonna do is just like visual inspection. Of course, you would suspect because it's uh, failed, there's big hum in it, and then it sort of came good. But uh, trust me, this is, I powered this up a few times over the years that I've had it lying around, um, hoping to get around to fixing it, and it's done that horrible hum every time, except when I go to shoot the video, of course. Oh, some hot snot on the lead there, look at that. Anyway, here's the big single inline SIP package power 
uh, amp chip. We can have a look at what uh, one that is, but yeah, they've got <laughs> had to bend it over like this. Another one, another big cap right up there, right next to the heatsink. That's not good layout. What are you doing, Sony? And all this tape, look, it really start. that's all just powdery stuff. It really starts to disintegrate here, and you might be able to see it. Anyway, the board comes out of there pretty easily, although uh, that ribbon cable at the back, I just like pulled that out as part of bringing the board back, so that might be annoying to get back in. Anyway, there's our CD mechanism, and you'll notice that here's rubber baby buggy bumper compliant, so just uh, for anti-vibration. Our tape drive for all you tape aficionados. So there's the PCB, and uh, really I can't see any uh, any bulges in those caps. Doesn't on the surface, doesn't look to be a problem, no pun intended. But yeah, putting them directly under the heatsink like that, that's a bit silly buggers. I <laughs> love the jumper that goes right over there like that, terrific. See the star grounding in there, and the star power as well. That's terrific. And you can see the, uh, the solder feathing on the chips as well. This is when they put it through the wave uh, solder, they put these little uh, solder traps, and they would that will uh, stop the pins actually uh, getting shorted when it passes through the wave soldering machine, either in that direction or in that direction, because they mount, they deliberately mount these chips at 45 degree angles like this to actually prevent uh, shorts between the pins, because you'll notice that there is no solder mask, none of that solder mask rubbish between pins, so there's nothing really to prevent uh, shorts in there apart from the physical orientation, because if you have it, if you have your chip, square like that, then all the pins on one side are going to be in a sharp shadow, a solder wave shadow, as it passes through the machine. And you're more likely to get uh, shorts and little uh, traps on the back side of your, uh, of, of your chip. That's why all three of these jobbies are all at 45 degree angles. Uh-oh, something's happening. This is switched off. There's a whining sound, 1.23 amps. Sounds like something's gonna go. Yep, it's not good. Anyway, switch the power off, and that heat sink is uh, surprisingly warm for the few seconds I had that on. It's turned on again. It's drawing 10 watts. So that's one sick puppy. Now, one of the good things about this design is that you can actually take it out like this, and really, all we've got is our DC input here. We don't even have to hook up the front panel. That's just the LCD and uh, some CD control switches at the top. This is for the uh, disc detection that the lid is closed. This just hooks up to the uh, CD mechanism, and then all these just hook up to the uh, cassette up the top. So we shouldn't really have to... Um, do anything. We just plug the speakers in here and Bob's your uncle So it's really quite nice when you can work on it just out in the open like that You can flip the board over and you can probe stuff and uh, but anyway, it's drawing 10 watts Just on idle like this. So yeah, something's up <laughs> Okay, I've just switched it back on again, and it's not doing that. So it's now drawing 0.4 uh, 40 milliamps. Oh, there it goes. Yep. It's doing it. Yep. 1.2 amps. All right, out of curiosity, let's see what's getting warm here. Once again, it's drawing the 40 milliamps. Got to wait for it to do something stupid. It's not going to fail on me now. Little hot, tiny hotspot over there. That's interesting. What is that? One specific hotspot there. That is the base of a cap. That puppy down in there. Shouldn't be using my metal poker, should I? Yep, I just had to go up to an amp. Something behind, yeah, uh, that's the uh, power amp. And of course that makes uh, complete sense because A, the heatsink is getting warm and B, it's dissipating 10 watts. Where are you going to dissipate 10 watts? If you dissipate 10 watts in a cap, it's just going to explode. So maybe we've got uh, runaway, um, some sort of oscillation on our power amplifier chip down there. But it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with that power amplifier chip. It could uh, just be like the power supply, like this hotspot over here. I'm going to check that cap there and see what the business is. Yes, I haven't even measured voltages yet. Thou shalt test voltages, but anyway. And at this point, we'll have a look at the awesome service manual uh, for it. I love Sony service manuals. They're absolutely brilliant. And it's published by the Quality Engineering Department. <laughs> Good on your Quality Engineering Department, printed in Japan, 1998. There we go. 
Anyway, it starts down with all the specs and uh, then disassembly, how to disassemble it, of course. Uh, uh, there is no troubleshooting uh, procedure in here, so you're on your own in that respect. But the fact that you've got this, it's just like, look at the disassembly set, front cabinet, LCD board, software, AC inlet, blah, 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 how to like deconstruct it. Like that's just, it's just absolutely brilliant. Well done. And old school tape speed adjustment stuff, mechanical adjustments. Oh, it's just, the v adjust the VCO. Oh, I found a CD section. Here's the main board. It's just absolutely fantastic. RF signal reference waveform eye pattern. Look at that. That's that's just EF balance adjustment. Uh, <laughs> focus tracking gain adjustment on the CD. Focus bias generator. Oh, that's, you know, it's fantastic. This is block diagram. So there's the, there's the AC in thing. Um, with the uh, switch, that's the switch that's connected. I'm surprised I don't have a dotted box around that like that to show that it's physically connected. The little micro switch that I showed you on the back that disconnects. That just switches between mains or AC uh, input there. And we've got a regulator here, and uh, which we will uh, suspect. And then here, this looks like, yeah, this is the function switch here. So as you can see, like the bottom position is like off, but it does actually consume some power in the off position i think i don't think it's entirely off so this regulator is a seven volt regulator here so I, I just love these overlays they're absolutely brilliant there's our rectifier board over there that's our secondary right so it comes in here here's our power connector input okay and here's our regulator and i can tell you that that can the suspect capacitor i believe is this one that one that got a little bit warm ski is c956 here 47 mic 10 volts so they've just got an a a, a single transistor uh, regulator there that'd be the first thing i'd be checking just to make sure thou shall check voltages it says our five volt regulator okay so that's doing it for the uh, uh digital logic stuff so yeah like single single transistor they don't need anything more than that that's they're saving money on that compared to when like an lm7805 voltage regulator for example it's going to be a couple of cents cheaper to implement that and i always find these things a bit hard to follow like you know <laughs> when you have to put the uh the switch in different uh, positions and stuff like that like in multiple places across you know the schematic often in different parts of the schematic um, like oscilloscopes are classic for this and things like that just trying to keep things like get the signal flow going anyway that's 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 a nice schematic i love it and yeah like i don't think there's that like we don't have to worry concern ourselves with all this uh digital logic down here like we're we're gonna come and guts are here oh here's our power amp so yeah, that's just a basic uh, Zener reference. There's our 7.5 volt Zener. Why do we get 6.9? Well, <laughs> 7.5 minus 0.6 volts drop typically, base emitter drop, that gives you 6.9. We don't win a chicken dinner. It's a 2SD, 23.96 for those playing long at home. And you can see that bad practice over here. They've put the dot there. It's always, you know, you put that through a couple of uh, facsimiles and that <laughs> dot could vanish direct battery input here and that actually goes directly powers the chip none of this uh, protection rubbish and then that drops down here via a, a protection resistor a 0.47 ohm into the regulator here that's kind of weird well they call that b plus 6.9 volts and b plus 9 volts i i'm not sure what the deal is anyway i'm going to go in and check that jobby there let's go there we go 6.8 whoop oh there we go it's it's doing the fail i didn't even touch it but that's remaining so it's not that rail so yep it's drawing 11 watts again so anyway this is where like you don't want to be probing in there like that you can accidentally short things out and you can really come a gutter it's best to get like little uh, easy hooks or some other uh probes that you can hook on so i've got one just hooked onto the bottom and one just hooked in and then just power it up and do it one by one it's just safer now there's actually no need uh, to suspect these two big uh, 2200 mic caps here because they're just the uh, AC output uh, coupling caps for the speaker. But of course one of the problems with suspecting a cap here is that there is no ripple. We're powering this from a DC supply so like even if one of these caps like a, a big main input uh, bypass cap had gone it's not an issue because we're seeing like presumably some sort of oscillation of the uh, power amp module um so you know th th that cap really has has no effect whatsoever okay i'm gonna 
probe Q952 down here. There we go, there's our 5 volt rail. So our uh, 6.9 volt rail and our 5 volt rail are both fine. Nothing to do with that. All right, so what we're going to look at now is, because it's most likely to be this uh, power amplifier, it's doing, because it's getting really hot, and it's most likely, like, not the inputs. Here's your volume front panel uh, volume pot and your tone control, uh, by the way. Like, it's in, it's almost certainly not a signal being actually injected into here, because that wouldn't cause it to do all this uh, funny business. So look, but we've actually got our DC voltage levels here. So we've got 4.3 there. Well, uh, these are uh, just bias, uh, DC bias levels. We've got our VCC coming in here, which is our nine volts, which is basically direct from our uh, supply input. Four and a half volts on that pin, seven and a half volts on that pin, nine volts on this uh, standby pin here, and uh, half a volt on these. Well, they're just the two line ins. That's just a bias level. So let's check those. Okay, this is our nine volt input. We expect that to be perfect. And nine volts, it's off at the moment. And we turn it on and we're getting the noise again. It's oscillating, doing whatever, and it drops because of the voltage drop. So we'd expect that. I turn it off and it's still going. Don't know if you can hear that, but it's still there. Again, uh, we're looking at pin five, which is one of the filter pins. It's just got a couple of caps on there. It could be one of those. And once again, we're fine, and we switch that on. And it's drawing 11 watts, drawing 1.2 amps, 5 volts. It should be 4.5. Eh. Our next pin should be 7.5 volts. We're getting 4.2. Aha! Now, so both of these voltages here are off. They're not 4.5. This one's grossly out, grossly low. So, um, these could be... Like, if one of these fails, maybe it's just, it's not going to be stable anymore. But these are, these voltages are not being fed in, because this is ground here. These are being generated internally. I can probably put up the block diagram uh, internal of this thing. So these are generated inside. So we've come a gutter right there. So right off the bat, you'd want to be checking those two caps. So it's those two there, C391392. Um, are they look okay but of course they could be uh, dead as a dodo now interestingly those caps are down around here basically under this hot snot so um you know hot slots usually pretty good but i don't know i'm just going to remove that to uh just see if like there's no uh, contamination or something on there that's causing it to come a gutter houston we've found the problem i should have given this a better visual inspection look at these joints Look at that, dry as a dead dingo's donger. Wow, these are, of course, the pins for the uh, power amplifier. Yeah, they've just um, they've just completely cracked. Thermal over the years, um, heating up, cooling down, that, that'd explain it. One's up the top, no, 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 no. Ah, oh, they've all come a gutter. That's terrible, Muriel. Well, I could have saved myself a little bit of time if I had just done a better visual inspection of uh, those. I like I I should have like yeah no excuse I should have looked at the power transistor. Of course, uh, it, it fits the uh, symptoms that we're seeing. Like it's like intermittent. Of course, the joints like this it'll be horribly intermittent. It uh, based on like it changes when you power the thing up because uh, like thermally it's different. And like who knows what issues you're going to get caught caused by not just one, but potentially more than one, although it might only be one that's actually the cause, but they all look horrible. Classic failure mode. So um, let's go and resolder those, shall we? Just show you the bit, those a bit better up close. That's Gonski. Look at them. Yep. Don't even think about why it's, uh, you know, how, what mechanism is causing that issue. Uh, yeah, when you've got <laughs> crack joints like that, and your power amplifier, yeah, it's going to ruin your day. And there's the after shot. Look at that. Beautiful. I uh, sucked out all of the uh, solder and put on fresh stuff. And that looks oh, it's beautiful. Thing of beauty. Joy forever. All right, so let's power that back on. I'm pretty darn confident. That's the issue. Yep, there we go. Yeah, it, it just faded out like I kind of remember it doing that. There we go. And it should fade out. As you turn it off, because as the uh, capacitors discharge, and then it instantly cuts off because there's like a standby feature. So you can't pick up anything in here, even AM. They still transmit on AM? <laughs> I think they are. Um, anyway, pretty confident that 
that sucker is fixed. Classic uh, joint, um, uh, classic joint, classic fault in the joint of a power device. In this case, the main power amplifier chip, but you'll get it on uh, main amplifiers and stuff like that. You'll get it on individual uh, power MOSFETs or BJTs that uh, and every time you use them, they, they thermally cycle. They actually heat up and, uh, you know, not all heat. Uh, gets out of the heatsink. Some of like the the pins heat up, and you know they cool down, heat up, and cool down. You do that for 20 years, and and the thing can fail. So, yeah, and it depends upon the exact uh, type of alloy solder that they used at the time. Different batches can cause problems, and uh, if they change the type, you know, there's all sorts of uh, you know metallurgical stuff that uh, goes into that as well. So that was a pretty easy fix in the end. I'm going to put this sucker back together and uh, it'll, I'm pretty sure it'll be winner winner chicken dinner. All I've got to do is find a CD to try it or maybe cassette. I think it needs a good uh, cleaner the head and, and all the uh, drive in that sucker if we ever use a uh, cassette anymore. Maybe a good mixtape. Yeah. And to get those cables uh, back into there from the CD mechanism there I've got to take the whole uh, top part of that off. So there's your rubber baby buggy bumpers for you tape transport aficionados. Sorry about the dust. Uh, yeah, I know, I'll clean it. Yeah, so the whole idea is that you take this top part off, the whole CD transport mechanism comes out. That is very, very nice. And that's really minimalistic, isn't it? That's what you'd expect, of course. You don't need anything more than that. And of course, this ribbon cable, you can now get in there, there's the uh, thing down there, and also this cable here pops up, so there we go, you plug that into there, and then you can plug that ribbon cable in, ah, Bob's your uncle. So you can actually really get a feel for how this is all assembled cheaply, this would be assembled on one line, the tape transport mechanism on another line, the PCB uh, on another line, and all the, you know, the front panel, then they just, like, it all just comes together, bang, and in, like, I don't know, 30 seconds, the whole thing's assembled. I'm really liking this thing. This is just the duck's guts. Oh. One interesting little cost-saving measure I noticed, the screws on the uh, back here that are actually visible, they're uh, black, and the ones that actually go down into those deep, dark holes, they're just, uh, you know, passivated, with a gold passivated or whatever it is. These ones are probably a bit, you know, half a bee's dick more expensive than these ones. So, yeah, they save cost on the internals because you can't see them. Beauty. What on earth is that song? I don't know. Anyway, I haven't got a CD here in the lab to uh, uh, fix this, uh, to, well, to check the uh, CD or a mixtape. But anyway, that's a winner winner chicken dinner. And yeah, we could have uh, fixed that without uh, the schematic at all. I mean, that was, that was an easy visual uh, fix, no problems whatsoever. But good thing about this Sony gear is that you can actually get, even for like a cheap ass, uh, well, I, mean, I don't know how cheap this was at the time, but you know, probably sub hundred dollars or whatever, and you get the full service manual for it. Then this isn't from the 70s or the 80s when that thing was the go. This is from almost the year 2000. This is like 1998. So, wow, you know, fantastic. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. It was a classic art fire, and if you did like it, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, you can discuss down below. Catch you next time. Yeah.